Please remember, graduate students, that you're in charge of bringing all the food and, the, <laughs> and trimmings to the party this evening. I'm counting on you to tell your classmates that it's still your responsibility. And there's so many things we could talk about in so little time, so I thought we'd just touch on or talk about some about three categories, I guess. Um, one is your, the Chicago style, which you're often identified with, and also uh, the forms that you write that are a little different than uh, contemporary mainstream writing with the short, short and poetry and so on, and also some common themes that reoccur. But uh, I thought we'd start off with uh, the term Chicago writer, which you're often identified as. I was just kind of curious as to how you feel about that term. Well, it, um, at this point, it might seem a little ingenuous to me to say <clears throat> that it was a surprise because it, the reviews have mentioned it so often, but it really was. When my uh, first uh, book of stories came out, I was living in the Keys and a long ways from Chicago. And the way I had written those stories um, was as individual pieces until I realized that there was an organizational principle in the fact that a lot of them had to do with childhood and a lot of them were set in Chicago. And so um, I organized them around that, that principle, but it, it never occurred to me that the Chicago element was what would be picked up. And um, as soon as it was pointed out to me, I actually saw it, but it, what was more what was uppermost in my mind was that they were stories about childhood and that they had strong Eastern European influences. Yeah. So, uh, you talk about um, childhood as, uh, particularly with your title, the childhood as a neighborhood itself. I was wondering if you could speak to what you see as the similarities of that. I mean, what is it about childhood that makes it a neighborhood? Um, well, let me just put that in a context and say that I, I guess if somebody asked me what I thought I wrote about, I would the answer wouldn't be Chicago, and it probably wouldn't be childhood. It would be perception. I, I think what I'm always looking for is some door in the story that opens on another world, and doorways like that are religious. Um, in fact, maybe that's the basic one for me. That is, when I grew up in on the southwest side, it was a neighborhood that was the, the two biggest landmarks on most every corner were a church or a tavern. So you would be walking down, let's say, 25th Street, which would represent ordinary reality. Ordinary reality would be made up by bread trucks delivering bread and people going to work and kids playing on the sidewalk and women hanging out wash and so on and so forth. But by just stepping through either one of those doorways, the tavern or the church, it seemed to me that you entered a different world. In the tavern you entered this world that moved to a different time. The time it moved to was whatever song was on the jukebox people told stories and behaved in ways that they would never behave on the street. And the church was the same thing. By just entering these doorways, you seemed to enter the medieval ages. There was in the smell of incense and statues and, uh, of uh, saints and martyrs in uh, grotesquely uh, tortured positions. And in a way, I think I've always, you know, what I look for as a writer in, in stories is is for those doorways in which somebody leaves ordinary reality into some kind of extraordinary reality. And so to get back to your question, childhood for me is one of those doorways. To me, childhood in itself seems like a state of extraordinary perception. That, and, and to inhabit that state or that neighborhood means that you're perceiving the world in a different way than is defined as ordinary. And it's that, it's, a, it's assuming that perception that interests me. It's, it's a lens that I, you can look through in which the world 
uh, then becomes a different, hopefully fresher, more vivid place. So, you know, you mentioned you have kind of almost a reluctance to the term sh Chicago writer. You feeling that that's a label of sorts? No, I, I, it isn't a reluctance. It's just a surprise. In, in fact, I mean, I was quite flattered to be in, included in in that kind of company, and um, it, it, I just had never assumed that kind of lineage. That's all. I it was. Um, I, I mean, some of my favorite writers. Uh, you know, I had tremendous admiration for Saul Bellow and, um, and Albert as well. And James Farrell, who, who doesn't get mentioned enough in that company, that, that Studs Lonigan trilogy was really a very important book for me. But I, I just, it just hadn't occurred to me that um, somebody would be generous enough <laughs> to mention my work in that company. I really mean that. Do you see yourself as being a part of any other literary tradition? Well, but well, I, I guess what I was trying to say was that the right, I'm, all that said about how I admire those writers, the writers that I was thinking about at the time I was writing those stories, were not those writers. And the, the reason is that uh, <clears throat> the departure, the personal departure, I felt I made for myself in order to acquire some kind of a voice that I was comfortable with was one that, especially in that first book, that combined elements of the grotesque or the fantastic with realism. And the Chicago tradition is, is a stubbornly realist tradition. And I, I, didn't really, I didn't really see my work in that realist tradition and therefore really didn't see my work in that, in that mm -hmm. therefore, in that Chicago tradition. Uh, you know, I mean, what's great about Bello and, and Auburn and, and Farrell is, is, is just how realistic and naturalistic in some degree their work is. Right. So, so the writers that I was kind of reading were more Eastern Europeans and um, uh, some of the uh, Hispanic writers. Right. And I'm thinking of the, the story Palatsky Man, one of the first stories from your early collection, Childhood and Other Neighborhoods, and that has a uh, certain kind of a magic realist quality to it and yet you're often identified with realistic or naturalistic writers like uh, writing from Nora Wealthy to James Joyce even sometimes uh, how, how do you account for the for that magic realist quality what influences were there that brought about that style um, I'm not sure I can I can tell you the anecdote I, I mean which is an exact true story of how came to write that story, which was the first story of that kind I wrote. And I would, I mean, I, I've kind of got really elect, eclectic taste. So I, I loved a lot of the realistic writers. I, I particularly love that kind of um, um, realistic voice that comes out of uh, Sherwood Anderson. Which you can follow through Hemingway and Salinger, and you know it's it's frequently a first-person voice. A lot of those writers wrote with young narrators, and so I found that a very familiar and a, a voice that I could readily a, adapt. But the problem I was having with it was that it sounded it it sounded like the way I was using it. It sounded pretty much like it would, uh, as adapted by any number of other writers. And so on some level I was dissatisfied with it because it didn't seem to me that I had found a style, a style that in some ways had what I felt were my own personal rhythms. And uh, I was listening to a ton of music and had already reached a point where mostly when I wrote I listened to some kind of music. Usually it was jazz. But I was listening more and more to classical music and more and more to chamber music. And I had gotten very interested in the music of Bella Bartok. And in reading about Bella Bartok I wrote, read about this other guy, Zoltan Kodai. And Bartok and Kodai um, were part of this movement which tried to use postmodern music, mainly French Impressionist music, 
and combine it with folk elements from their own culture. And in order to do this, they took trips into the wilds of Hungary with very primitive recording devices and recorded the real gypsy music. Not the kind of stuff that Brahms was using, but I mean, true primitive stuff based on bagpipe riffs and strange modal chords and so on and so forth. And then they tried to integrate it into their own music. All right, well, so anyway, so this sounded really interesting to me. So I got these records out by Zoltan Kodai and I put them on the record player, and I sat down and I wrote a story that I never had even thought about writing, which was the Palatsky Man. It was, I mean, it literally was almost like falling into a trance. And I, I, I basically think what happened was the same thing that happens in a fifth grade classroom when the teacher brings in Ravel's Bolero and says to the kid, now kids, now today we're going to listen to Ravel's Bolero, and you write whatever comes into your mind, and then it begins, <laughs> and everybody's writing, ah, I see camels going across the desert. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're dancing at the oasis. <laughs> and, I mean, those, that music just brought up all these images, but the images it brought up happened to be these Eastern European images, which on some level, I guess, I had grown up with. But I had never been able to harness them or tap into them. And I had really not read very much. I had read no magical realism at, at that point. I hadn't read um, Babel. I hadn't read uh, Chesvois Mivage. I had read very little Kafka. But as soon as I started writing those stories, it, I immediately developed this kind of hunger to go and see what other kinds of stories there might be like this. And that's when I really started reading a lot of Kafka. And shortly thereafter, just by happenstance, uh, Marquez's book, A Hundred Years of Solitude, appeared. And from that I you know, discovered a lot of the poets like Vallejo and Neruda. But it, 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 really, the, it really was the music that had generated the story, and then only after that did I circle back and start finding a kind of a literary base for that. Are you able to recreate that feeling now? I mean, no, um, no I, I wore it out. You wore it out? I wore it out. But, but for years after that, <coughs> Um, I, I would gather all this music because as soon as I put on the music, it, it was literally almost like a physical feeling. I mean, I could almost feel it in my, as a, some kind of biological, electrical <laughs> path in my mind that I, I would just start feeling like I was going to some place in my brain where all this stuff lurked. And I guess I reached the point where, where I, I overdrew the account. <laughs> you know, and, and then I it began, you know, I, I and and it's it's not quite there anymore. But by that time, I had written most of the stories in that first book, and in fact, um, this I I don't two of the writers that you mentioned, Welty and uh, Joyce, I, I don't really see them as realistic writers. I mean, I, I'm sure they can be viewed that way, but to me, they're 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 lyrical writers. And I, I think in the second book, having exhausted that that Eastern European account that I was drawing on, uh, in which to me the primary element was the fantastic, fantastic or the grotesque, uh, the grotesque as defined in a great book by a guy named Wolfgang Kaiser, where he describes it as a third genre, uh, along with comedy and tragedy. He says that there's this third genre called the grotesque. Um, and I think the combination in, the, in that coast of Chicago is actually closer to Welty and, and um, Joyce, which is um, to try to combine the lyric mode with the realistic mode. And, and I mean, and that's what fascinates me about those writers, besides their incredible allegiance to sense of place. Um, in Coast of Chicago, uh, I think part of what you know, you're describing the uh, your East European influences, and I think part of that probably has to do, in addition to you know the, the neighborhoods that you grew up in, uh, was probably influenced by that. And I'm wondering um, how this uh, Chicago as a patchwork of ethnic neighborhoods, you know, how that um, affected your development as a writer, uh, particularly since you you know now that you've lived away from Chicago for some time and. Like you said, you were living in the Keys when your first collection was actually published. 
Idaho, you, you've had it, and you lived in New York for some time, you've had a chance to sort of distance yourself from that, but Coast of Chicago is still very much tied up with that, uh, that strain in your writing. Well, I, I think it, you know, I, I mean, a lot of writers leave in order to write about a place. I, 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 I go back kind of to charge up again, too. I mean, sometimes I'll just rent a hotel room and live there for a while. But one of the problems, um, and, I mean, and it certainly depends wholly on temperament. You, you know, I, I mean, apparently Faulkner um, absolutely needed to live in the place that he wrote about, whereas clearly Joyce did, did not. For me, because a lot of what I'm writing takes huge liberties with the imagination, I, I actually found it difficult to be writing about it. A, a somewhat imaginatively transformed L station, say the Bryn Mawr L station, and then to actually be passing the real Bryn Mawr L station. I, I mean that, that, um, and, you know, for me the writer's first allegiance is to the imagination. And, and so it, it was a good thing for me to leave and write about it away from, away from the area. Um, as, as far as the ethnic neighborhoods and so on and so forth, I, I mean, that's become um, so impressed on my memory and personality that I don't really have to be there for it. But I, I'd say along with music, the, um, the other most uh, important influence on me was my, uh, my Polish grandmother, who um, could hardly speak any English. Um, even up into her 90s when she finally died. But we were able to communicate through this kind of my pidgin Polish and her pidgin English. But even more, there was this nonverbal communication that went on through body language and, and particularly the intensity of her eyes and just some kind of powerful nonverbal emotive ability that she had that was so un-American, or maybe not American, I suppose is what I mean, but. <laughs> and, and it's all, and I, I, I mean, I value that to such a degree because the, what I would consider, quote, American, uh, depending on how it's def def defined, could almost be a pejorative word, that is the, 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 the way that America digests and homogenizes everything and spits it back out into these McDonald's-like portions is what is least interesting to me about this country. What's most interesting to me about it is, is its ethnic variety, its cultural variety, and its sense of genuine place, which is one of the reasons that the South fascinates me so much, because the South is an but also huge cities like New York, which have, which have managed to remain impermeable to all that homogenization. And um, one, of the, one of the things that a lot of my stories are about, I mean, a lot of the stories are actually about music, but a lot of the stories are act also about nonverbal experience that is frequently in stories people are longing after languages that don't exist. And, and that all comes from that, my grandmother. You talked about your, you know, the powerful emotive quality of your grandmother's communication. And I'm wondering if um, maybe that has something to do with the more lyrical quality of the Coast of Chicago stories that you were talking about, if maybe you're trying to get at that in some way. Well, yeah, yeah, I think I am. I, I mean, the kinds of stories that I don't like are stories that are not interested in emotion. It seems to me that that's a risk that a writer wants to take, that a story sh should leave you feeling something deeply. That one of the things that's beautiful about music is that music is an emotional teacher. That it teaches you about all the different shades of emotion. And that, in fact, all the arts are nonverbal. You know, I mean, painting is a nonverbal art, dance is a nonverbal art, with the exception of film, 
of, of the narrative arts, film, theater, and particularly fiction and poetry. But I think actually that those arts, paradoxically, should also be nonverbal. I mean, it's a total paradox because they're based on language. I don't know if I can articulate it, articulate this, but I think that the kind of fiction I'm after is as essentially nonverbal as music is. And by that I mean is that it should take you to a point in emotion that there aren't words for. That is that what you're feeling can't be paraphrased by the words we have in the language. Does the minimalism of um, roughly half of those stories, the, the ones usually set up by the great pages, is, is that what you're trying to, is that a part of that? Yes. Okay. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of feeling, I'm, I'm reminded of something you said in 1983, if I can go back 12 years to pull something out. In a roundtable discussion you had with other Chicago writers, and in, in, in that discussion, you mentioned um, sentiment as being a part of, of the Chicago style, uh, but you were careful to point out that sentiment was feeling, as you've just described, and not the sentimental. Right. Yet, uh, you know, a lot of your stories have a, a nostalgic edge to them, and also contain a lot of that feeling. But uh, I was kind of curious as to how you were able to do that, balance the two, without crossing the line in the sentimentality, which you don't. I, I don't. I, I can't give you a, a capsule answer because each story, usually, although the stories connect, each story usually poses its own somewhat different problem, and um, so you kind of solve it story by story. But you know, it's clearly an ongoing risk that I, I just, for instance, it's very much the same risk one takes when you write any childhood story, just by its very nature, a story about children, the risk you're automatically taking is it's going to be a corny, sentimental story. And so, on either a conscious or unconscious level, the, the writer has to, you know, from the very start, be, be taking that into account and continually devising strategies to uh, both harness the sentiment and the subject, but at the same time undercut the sentimentality. But in one story it might be understatement and irony, and in another story it might be the incidents are so brutal that, that they balance off any kind of uh, sentimental feelings. You know, in a, another story it might still be, it might be yet something else, and so there, there isn't really one solution to it. Are, are you aware of that dynamic, though, when you write? Are you aware that there is that danger? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, nostalgia in particular, I mean, the, it seems to me that nostalgia, be, because that nostalgia is built into the immigrant experience, that, that you can't have one without the other. I mean, just the very fact that someone is leaving their home, that's going to be a part of it. It's, it, it, it really interested me when I began reading the, uh, the Hispanic writers, how much more they how much more nostalgia was a part of their emotional palette. How much more, you know, I mean, in other words, you've got people in Marquez walking around saying, oh, my nostalgia, in a way that, <laughs> <laughs> that you know, you could never get away with as an American writer, or which has got this, this British tradition that really doesn't have that. I mean, that's not a British, that's not an Anglo-American feeling. So, so it's an opportunity to integrate that into the American emotional palette, but it's also an immediate danger when you do it. And so you know, so you have to find some way to, to both integrate it and diffuse it at the same time. Um, but, but to ignore it, I think, is to ignore that aspect of the experience. To, over, to become self-indulgent about it is obviously to, to undermine the very feeling that you're trying to, to um, have this respectful representation of. Um, we've talked a little bit about you know, two of the, you know, the important influences on your work, and one of them, that uh, another one that seems to keep popping up um, more particularly 
um, is that sort of the image of Mayor Daley in, in the history of Chicago, and in two places in particular, uh, in both of your short, uh, short story collections, you mentioned the, the, the sorry for the inconvenience sign, you know, which sort of brings the, the sort of specter of Daley right into, right into the story itself. And um, I'm wondering what it meant to you, or you know, means to people, to a kid growing up in Chicago, you know, during the, the various administrations of Mayor Daley. Well, I don't know. It, I mean, there's about five different ways I could answer that question. The, the, the simplest one is that Daley was everywhere as I grew up, and that meant that because he was a colorful uh, politician, it, it was. It was uh, as uh, William Price Fox, one, one uh, teacher of mine at the University of Iowa, once said to me about growing up Catholic. He says, "It's good material. <laughs> Use it." <laughs> and I mean, and the same thing is true with Daly. And, and uh, I, anybody who writes about Daly owes a tremendous. Uh, it, you know, a, a writer I haven't talked about is Mike Ryko. And that book, Boss, I, I thought was a wonderful book. And what, what Ryko did better than anybody else is, is he uh, showed just how funny that material could be. So, so there's that comic element. Um, I guess two other elements that interest me are the fact that he represented a certain kind of a paternalism that in... On one level or another, a lot of my stories are, I, I would consider them kind of anti-paternal. Um, I've always wanted to use, um, at some time or another, that Bob, opening Bob Dylan line in uh, Highway, what is it, 61? Mm -hmm. Bob's, God says to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe says, man, you must be putting me on. <laughs> God says no. Abe says what? God says you can do anything you want to, but <laughs> the next time you see me coming, you better run. <laughs> Abe says where you want this killing done. God <laughs> says up on Highway 61. Yeah. <laughs> and growing up during Vietnam, where you had this older generation seeming to want to send this younger generation. The war, those became, I mean, it was no accident that Dylan wrote that verse during that time. And so, you know, that was the time of this huge generation gap. And in a way, Daly was representative, an, an, an easy and probably cheap representation, but a representation nonetheless of that gap between different ways of perceiving the world. This was this kind of older paternalistic ordering way that was done on this series of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. and So, so there was that representation. And, um, I, I guess I'll stop on that point. This is in, um, in a number of the stories there, uh, in the ones that deal specifically with childhood in some way or another, um, there's an absence of the father figure. Exactly. An absence in Chopin, exactly. Winter, for right. instance, Blight, you know, um, <clears throat> Well, well, at, at the book I'm working on now pushes that even further. Yeah. And and I, you know I'm I'm kind of like I'm kind of because I'm working with that material I'm I'm kind of disinclined to fall into the analytical mode about it. I, I mean I I really kind of right now know what it is I'm trying to say about it, but but I I want it said through fiction before I start talking analytically, so if you'll let me just duck out on that one for the time. Of course. Time. I guess uh, maybe that would be a good point to switch a little gears and maybe talk about uh, the forms you write in. Uh, the short, short story seems to have gained a lot in popularity in the last couple of years. You're a practitioner of it and often anthologized in uh, books like flash fiction and sudden fiction, and uh, I was wondering if you had any insights into the rising popularity of that form. I, I really don't. I, I guess I, I just read the same things you have about it, 
people are linking it to shorter attention spans and MT watching MTV and so on and so forth. And um, I think I come to, to it through poetry. And I, I mean, personally, I remember exactly how I got interested in it. It was um, an old friend of mine named Peter Fiore who I knew from Chicago, um, we used to just read each other's work. We used to meet at this bar called Connolly's, uh, an Irish bar on, on Devon. And he came walking into the bar one day and he had written a bunch of these things and I thought they were terrific. And so I just thought I'll start writing these too. And, and that was long before short shorts or anything else. And I, I, I think the only other stuff of the kind I had seen at that point, I had also liked a lot which were um, those little vignettes that Hemingway separated the stories from in, in our time. And uh, to me, they still read as fresh today as they did, as they must have when he wrote them, I guess, back in the 20s. And, and, and for a long time, those were the only two things of the kind I knew. And then I, I finally got around to um, picking up some translations of Rambo's work. And there were, you know, there were the prose poems, and they're still some of the best prose poems I've ever read. So I, I had kind of always scribbled along those little, those little pieces and never knew what to do with them. And then um, there was this huge prose poem, Madness, to strike um, American literature in the 60s, you know, long after, and 70s, long after other cultures that already had, you know, prose poem was no big deal because they'd been doing it for a zillion years, but there, um, there was this kind of uh, second wave of Frenchifying, Francophiling American poetry in the 60s <laughs> and 70s, which brought on the prose poem. So all these little um, semi-prose pieces, I s suddenly there was this channel. Poetry editors were now publishing them. So it was great. I didn't care what they called them. <laughs> and I, you know, I'd been writing all these things anyway, so I started having my short prose or prose poem pieces published by poetry editors, along with a lot of other people. And one of the things I began notice, noticing at the time is that a lot of poets whose work I liked were trying these things, and that generally I thought they were writing better in poetry than prose. And it kind of started bothering me. And I waited very, with great anticipation for a book that Michael Benedict was, I knew he was doing. He was editing poetry at that time for the Paris Review. And he was publishing a lot of prose poems, and he himself wrote a lot of prose poems. And I was really waiting for this book of his with great anticipation. And when it came out, I, I, there were tons of stuff in it that I really liked. But a lot of the stuff seemed flat to me and, 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 and uninteresting and, and disappointing to me. And I read his introduction, which I thought was really cogent. And one of the things that he said in his introduction was that the prose poem developed as part of this postmodernist anti poetry um, movement. And it was at that point I realized what was bothering me about a lot of the so-called prose poems, and that was that you could only read them in the context of traditional poetry. That is, they were anti-poetry, but in order to appreciate what they were doing, you needed to be, one needed to be totally familiar with the entire theory of what formal and traditional poetry was, and so, so that like a lot of conceptual art, it only worked if you understood what, what it was putting itself in opposition to. And that's always been my problem with conceptual art is that it's, it's sometimes more interesting to talk about the theory of it than to actually read or listen to the stuff itself. And I didn't want to write stuff like that. So I immediately began thinking of what I was doing was just little stories. I wanted to distance myself from the prose poem. So I started reading these stories. And then the second wave of stuff came. Short shorts, which is now supposed to be fiction. So, right, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of laughter, which is one of those uh, stories in the Nighthawk sequence from the coast of Chicago, 
which uh, appeared you know, years earlier in Brass Knuckles in a slightly different form, but pretty much the same uh, as poetry. So, I'm, is there a does the context change the way the perception of that piece? You think? It, or? Well, it, it changed the writing of the piece for me. That is, I mean, one of the things I liked about the prose poem was that it and. I mean, this is strictly temperamental. I'm not claiming that this exists as, as an aspect of the prose poem. But for me, freed from line, from, which is um, freed from writing in line, it allowed me to open up the quote prose poem in a way that I was not able some, in some ways to open up some of my poems. And when I freed myself from thinking of those short pieces as prose poems, I got that burst, a second burst of that feeling. So when I started thinking about laughter as a short fiction rather than as a prose poem, I actually rewrote it and expanded it still further. Right. And, and that, I'm, I'm kind of looking for that expansive principle within something that's, I mean, all those things are compressive principles. But for me, within the compressive principle of the short short, there's still a, an expansive principle that I don't find in formal poetry or in the prose poem. Okay. Um, since we brought up Nighthawks, um, and you're talking about the compression, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Nighthawks is an interesting piece because it's different in some ways from the rest of Stuff in Coast of Chicago because it's a sequence of uh, a sequence of the shorter pieces uh, engaging the work by Edward Hopper the painting Nighthawks. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what the relationship between you know the painting and that sequence is. You know, what is it about the painting that resonates so vividly that made you want to write about it and yet write about it in that form? Well, the, the form is a form I love. And I've used it in a lot of other places in it. its theme and variation. And before that piece was called Nighthawks, it was called Nocturnes. And my notion was I had been working on this story called Chopin and Winter. And listening to music as I usually do, and found myself gravitating towards the Nocturnes. They were putting me in the mood I wanted for the story. So in the story itself, in fact, nocturnes start figuring heavily into the story. But after I finished the story, I thought, would it be possible to just write these a series of mood pieces, which is what nocturnes are? They're not sonatas, and they're not, you know they're not they're they're less formal than a lot of musical forms. And so I thought by naming it nocturnes, it would give the reader some some clue as to how to read it. That is. What, what is holding all these things together? But so when you're, you know, um, when you're working in something that doesn't have a good straight narrative line, you're always looking for formal clues to give the reader as to how to read, as, as to how to put the piece together, since the reader doesn't have a narrative line to follow. And then I, it, so it was only later that I started thinking about the painting, and as soon as I thought about the painting. Reluctantly dropped the the title of Nocturnes because the painting gave me a whole series of images that I could also then um, also use as a formal as repeated variations, and it seemed to me that the painting gave it even even a stronger sense of narrative propulsion than Nocturnes did. So I I switched over. You know, but it was, it, I mean, basically, it was the same thing I was looking for in both, was some way to create individual pieces that at the same time seem linked by some way other than a straight narrative line. Uh, you know, I'm curious, you know, back to form a little bit. Uh, are, are you conscious, you know, you mentioned that you know, the, the whole short, short story kind of gave you an avenue, or at least an excuse and a, and a means to publish what you so much like to write. Uh, are, are you conscious of a uh, form when you write, 
or do you rather write a piece and then later realize how it, uh, how the piece itself realizes a form? Um, usually the pieces, I, I mean a lot of what I write starts out as poetry. I, I'm, you know, I mean probably 20%, 30% of the stories I've published are, are actually on some level to me failed poems. <laughs> I, I, they start, I, you know, I mean, stories that you would never think would have started out as a poem like Blight, really for a long time was a, was a, was written in, in a poem, and I had the, the nutty notion on that one to try to turn it into a, a poem that imitated a Lenny Bruce monologue. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, the idea was it was supposed to be a comic poem the way comedians get up there and tell monologues, and I, I still would like someday to write a poem that's just a, basically based on a comedian's comic monologue. But I, I mean, finally, what happens is characters start asserting themselves. They take it, they take it over, and then for me, it becomes a piece of fiction. And as and as, as soon as a piece has fictional qualities, I let it go. I mean, my notion is that if if it if something else tries to make it be other than a poem, then it probably wasn't supposed to be a poem. And, and, I, and I, I let it become a piece of fiction. So, you know, just just that kind of procedure um, means that I'm not casting these things from the start in one kind of a form or another. But a second answer to your question, and it relates particularly to the short short, is I, I'm always looking for a way out of form, out of out of standard form. And standard form for a short story is only a beginning, a middle, and an end. But I'm always looking for a way to explode form. And that's one of the things I like about the short short is that nobody knows what they are yet. And there aren't the same expectations of them that there are of short stories. And I like that. I, I, I'm, I'm constantly looking for pieces that, that confuse me. And uh, I mean, sometimes they confuse me so much that I that that they don't work. <laughs> and, uh, Night, I mean, Nighthawks is something I'm not going to go back and do for uh, quite a long time because I ended up putting way more time into that than I had envisioned myself doing, and uh, you know, frequently didn't know where in the world I was I was with that. And I, I mean, so I had only too well succeeded for myself. I'm not talking about a reader or a critic, but I had only too well succeeded for myself in putting myself in a state of absolute floundering around. <laughs> and it only and it felt great to be writing in a more traditional form after that. I mean, sooner or, sooner or later, you, you know, you 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 want to keep surprising yourself, and that short short is in that no man's land between fiction and poetry, and, and I, I like to be there. It's it's a it's a comfortable place to be to be lost and not to have to feel like you have to deliver on certain expectations that the genre has set up. Uh, I I feel the same way about closure. You know that is that I'm always looking for a way to, cl to close a story that isn't kind of the traditional the character has a realization or something. Um, actually, talking about genre, um, one of the I guess the major genre you haven't apparently sort of dabbled in has uh, been the novel. Do you have any ambition to, to try to, like you said, explode or to you know explode your subject matter oh. into a novel? Oh, I've more than dabbled that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble is it's been dabbling. But, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I I mean I've actually had, you know I've been working on 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 them off and on. I I just. Uh, they just haven't quite gelled yet. It's it's certainly a genre I have enormous admiration for him and and want to publish it. Um, and chapters of a novel I've been working on have, have actually appeared in places like Atlantic and Chicago Magazine. It's just that um, it, it's it's a family novel, unfortunately, and um, non literary problems have um, have also been part of the reason I've published that. Um, yeah, as a problem for the writer writing a novel, how, how is it different, or how do you approach that differently from the, the shorter works? Well, I, 
I mean, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to talk about something that I really haven't, don't have out there. But, but I, I'll, I'll, a short answer to that is what I love about the short story is that you can jump into it where it's already geared up at a high level. You can, you can jump into a story already in third gear and then kick it into fourth and fifth so that there's no, whereas the beauty of the novel is rising and falling action. And I think temperamentally, um, what I temperamentally like is rising, rising, rising action. <laughs> and when I hit falling action, I mean the very thing that makes the novel beautiful, which is that long arch of architecture, is what makes me tremendously nervous as a writer. When I hit that falling action part, I'm, I'm filled with panic. <laughs> uh, one of the forms that we haven't really talked a lot about, but yet you're uh, accomplished at it, is the poetry. Um, and thinking poems like uh, that you use, like many uh, poets do, and they take mythology and update it to contemporary times. You do that in Brass Knuckles with the Rape of Persephone and Lazarus and Orpheus, poems like that. And I'm wondering if, if the same influences you had with the Eastern European uh, folklore if that same kind of influence was uh, present when you decided to take these myths? And um, I, to some degree, yeah, sure. I mean, that, that early book, um, the poets that I think influenced me a lot were Robert Lowell and also